Okay, well, hello everybody. Um, welcome. Um, this uh, is a session focused on the Northern Powerhouse, uh, and it's part of Real Estate Live, which is uh, a week of uh, free online events um, that we've been organising uh, to uh, keep the conversation going around economic development and regeneration in this uh, weird uh, and yet critical time. Um, this session, put together by Creators Communications, thanks very much, guys, um, is going to be chaired by Sean Anstey. Um, and uh, it's going to take a, a, a different angle on, uh, on the Northern Powerhouse. Um, and as I say, it's part of this program of Real Estate Live events. Um, we've had a great time this week so far. We've had uh, more than a dozen events and we've had about 1,200 people joining in. It's really good. And um, we've got loads more. I'll, I'll tell you about them at the end. Um, but for now, I'm going to hand over to Sean Anstey and say, Sean, yours. Ross, uh, thank you very much and good morning to everybody. Um, Kratos is uh, really proud to be opening and hosting uh, this session on the Thursday. As I said, my name's uh, Sean Anstey. I'm the Executive Director for Advisory Public Affairs and PR at uh, Kratos. And just a little bit about Kratos before we get into uh, the debate. We're a dedicated uh, public affairs, uh, strategic advisory and engagement consultancy. Uh, and we specialise in working with, uh, local with and in uh, local government. Uh, and we do this either through directly advising councils, chief executives and leaders, or by representing uh, the interests of our commercial clients, uh, either through engagement on planning applications or through uh, helping them to navigate a complex local uh, public sector. So our team is uh, made up of professionals from across uh, local government uh, and we service clients nationally from offices in London, Bristol, Southampton and uh, Manchester. So that's a little bit about us and uh, please feel free to, to get in touch if we can help. So the Northern uh, Powerhouse um, enters the theme of uh, today's uh, debate. We entered it entered the public consciousness uh, during the 2010 uh, coalition uh, years. It was a concerted effort to coordinate uh, improvement in the north of England. Uh, and often forgotten, it was a concept and an idea that was born uh, in the north of England, but was significantly accelerated massively uh, when it had the buy-in of the then Chancellor George Osborne, uh, working predominantly with Labour uh, city leaders across uh, the north of England and a very simple concept really which is that if you invest in transport, uh, skills and housing uh, alongside the devolution of power then you can ha have a very significant impact on making some serious inroads into improving um, economic productivity of the north and reducing uh, the uh, economic gap between the north and the south. So generally speaking uh, this uh, concept has been focused around our cities, so Liverpool, Manchester, Sheffield, Leeds uh, and Newcastle. But what we wanted to do today was not just talk about our cities, but extend that a little bit into, well, what about the whole of the north? If you're in Barrow, Penrith, Middlesbrough, Blackpool, uh, other places, how do we make sure that all of our towns and villages uh, are able to benefit uh, and uh, thrive in this concerted effort? Uh, to uh, improve uh, the north of England. So uh, to do that, we have uh, an absolutely stellar panel of people who are joining me for the uh, debate today. That's Alison mackenzie Follin, who's the Storwalt Chief Executive of Wigan Council, uh, formerly a Deputy Chief Executive of Wigan, with responsibility for all of their operational uh, services. Alison is hugely passionate about public services, uh, determined to make a difference for residents and communities, a board member of Unify Credit Union, spokesperson for Solace on the digital agenda and sits on the board of Open Data at Manchester. So a huge welcome to Alison. Thank you for joining us. We have Dan Mitchell, who's partner at Barton uh, Wilmore. Dan's uh, been at Barton, Barton Wilmore since 2008 uh, and leads the company's Manchester and Leeds offices. Huge range of experience advising on major housing schemes, employment development and retail projects on behalf of house builders, developers and the public sector. Uh, so Dan, welcome uh, to you. Uh, we have Chris uh, Blackhurst, who is uh, an extremely accomplished uh, journalist and former editor of The Independent, uh, city editor of The Evening Standard and presenter of headline interview on London Live, uh, an award-winning journalist, uh, we should say, from Cumbria. Uh, originally, Chris has written extensively on the Northern Powerhouse Project and the economy of the North. And then finally, we have Anna Heaton, uh, a partner at Adelshaw. Uh, Goddard, um, again in their Leeds office, um, Adelshaw Goddard were founder members of the Northern Powerhouse Partnership and Anna and her colleagues have produced a major report on uh, Northern Powerhouse Rail, a key component of making this thing a success, supported by the partnership uh, and advises institutional investors, property companies, local authorities and asset managers uh, on, all, on all of their property-based direct and indirect uh, transactions. So 
um, a hugely talented panel. And hopefully what we're going to try and do today as we move through uh, the next uh, 50 minutes or so is have uh, a fun northern conversation about um, real estate, about uh, what we can do to get the whole of the north to benefit from this concept. And to start us off, um, Anna is going to uh, give some introductory remarks. So Anna, uh, welcome and over to you. Thanks, Sean. Um, yes, I'm, I'm here to uh, partly represent Adelshaw Goddard, but also to represent the Northern Powerhouse Partnership. Um, AG were founder members of the Northern Powerhouse Partnership. It's an organisation that is chaired by George Osborne and came out of those discussions around 2010 that Sean referred to. Um, it's formed of a, a business-led board um, alongside city leaders and um, Lord O'Neill and John Cridlin um, from TFN, Transport for the North, also form part of that board. It's a non-political organisation and it, and it aims to support the growth of the northern economy um, through focusing on the, the key sectors that the northern leaders have decided that are the most important. So things like advanced manufacturing, energy, health and digital. For us, supporting MPP and being part of MPP is important. It, it aligns very much with the way that we approach our business and we, the way that we think our clients do as well. So looking at those key sectors, um, I myself am co-head of our transport sector group. And as Sean said, um, looking at road and rail as well as um, bus and um, cycle and other transport developments in the north, we think is critical to, to growing that, that connectivity. Um, digital is, is also really important and I think even, even more important in today's context um, and thinking about how things like energy products can support that as well um, and to support the, the basically the, the, it, it, the innovative um, businesses we have across the north. Um, we work with MPP, as Sean said, on a number of thought leadership campaigns. The MPR report was something that was really important to us last year and that really showed that the um, thousands of businesses that we surveyed for that report all supported, um, well, largely supported, I think it was about 80%, supported the adoption of NPR as a way to grow their economies and the way to connect them up with new employees in different parts of the North that currently don't have access to jobs and skills. Um, the latest report that MPP has put together is called Power Up the North, and that was published last month after a, a YouGov poll, poll and that looks at how the North can respond to the current crisis and look to that next phase. So things like green energy jobs, training for those um, who have maybe suffered in the current crisis and will continue to be left behind, um, new broadband and full fibre connectivity and also transport, transport infrastructure. And I think it is really important that we look at how we build back better. That's obviously a phrase that is, is becoming more prevalent in the Northwest at the moment. And I think the whole of the North is willing to get behind that as a concept. How do we make sure that we um, make sure that the elements, of the elements of the North that have been left behind are not left behind further and that we make the best of what we can in, in a levelling up um, environment to make sure that all of the people of the North have access to, to what they need um, to make as strong as economic future for themselves as they can. Fantastic, Anna. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that. And some really, you know, we're already starting to think about transport, digital connectivity, and how do we make sure that people benefit from everything that's happening? So uh, to move on to that, I'm going to ask Alison to come in with some remarks now around um, you know, leading your uh, borough. Wigan is in between Liverpool and Manchester, a huge borough actually in Greater Manchester. Um, and uh, it would be interesting now to get your thoughts on, uh, on, on this topic and then we can carry on with the debate. I'll ask it over to you. Thank you, Sean. Um, yeah, just coming on a few particular points. Um, of, uh, as a council, we've got uh, massive plans under our economic strategy. Uh, the We Are Wigan strategy is really about placing ourselves at the centre of the northwest because of our good connectivity, our amazing green space, and what we can offer young families and really what we could do as a borough. So I think with COVID, it's uh, given us a time to reflect. I think we were all quite worried, really, in terms of uh, when lockdown first started, because we were about to start um, a massive major town regeneration project. We've got um, significant retail space, particularly in Wigan Town Centre. 
and um, you know I think some of us were thinking just as we were about to start some of our really ambitious plans for the next 10 years they could come crumbling down um, you know sort of at the side of us but I think what it's shown us that it's accelerated some of our thinking and intensified some of the trends in uh, sort of decline of the retail sector and you know put the spotlight on uh, what we need to do um, around that sector and think about what we need to do when the crisis is over and, and the high street. And we've actually put our high street funds bid in uh, early, uh, three and a half weeks early, as part of what we need in terms of levelling up for the town centres, and that one's around Wigan. Um, I think we've had to think about diversifying our town centres, bringing in new spaces, uh, such as residential, culture, leisure, food, drink, and particularly going back to the point around digital. We've got we're seeing a real demand coming in for workspace, and it's how actually how we meet some of that demand uh, now more than ever in terms of that live workspace. So we've actually got um, an area in the town centre where we're designating live workspace and bringing back King Street, which is uh, one of our famous streets in terms of the nighttime sector. But actually, how how do we diversify that? I think the other important sector really has been around um, high quality public amenity space. And for those people living in towns and city centres, I think that quality of public space is really important in our plans um, and what we can do in terms of levelling up. So we've shown, haven't we, the ability for us all to work remotely now. So we think there'll be an increase in demand for flexible workspace and the opportunity to work perhaps more alongside traditional uh, office space. So I think our key sectors, I mean, we're, we're 90 two percent uh, small to medium enterprises and I think it remains to be seen how many of those will survive coming out of COVID but some of our manufacturing around food logistics distribution and other areas um, are, have, you know are managing to maintain and sustain their focus um, but really what we're trying to do in Wigan is drive those higher value sectors such as digital and creative and try and get opportunities for young people which the work we're doing on incubation, incubation space in, in the, the borough is really important. I think, you know, one of the things that we are is committed to the long-term plans for growth and regeneration, but we need that sustainable future for jobs and homes because the only way we're going to get out of some of our financial crisis at the moment, we're looking at probably around 25 million, is around business rates and council tax income to deliver some of our uh, vital essential services so in terms of sort of levelling up and the funding that we need from central government and what the Northern Powerhouse can do in the midst of the crisis and what we have done is, you know, get behind some of our bids on future high street funding, uh, make sure that we get that in, focus on interrelated projects where we can look at that transformational change, really creating and sustaining the economy and, and the town centre and thinking about um, the quality of our culture and leisure offer um, I think one of the things um, we do need um, is that, you know, if we're being slightly critical of where we've got with the Northern Powerhouse, I don't think it has created, um, you know, enough jobs for Wigan residents. Um, you know, those jobs have been at the regional centre and we haven't been creating the, the high volume jobs in Wigan. So we do need that investment in infrastructure. We need to overhaul the skills system. We need help help for people to access skills and the training that they need um, and that's really important so there's a huge opportunity um, you know we, we've got a lot to build on and as you rightly said Sean we're in an enviable position with the West Coast Main Line uh, we face uh, over to Liverpool and the Liverpool City region um, and to the rest of the North West so we need to capitalise on that and really level up so you know the problems around Green Book appraisal for places like Wigan and the methodology for things that we want to do in terms of public sector investment. You know, we have viability challenges like lots of places and we need to think about how we look at things differently in terms of places like Wigan where we have issues with remediation and low values. So lo lots of opportunities, but also lots more that we need to do. That's fantastic, Alison. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And there's a there's a question actually that's coming just for you that we maybe should take as we run through this. And it says, Alison Harris from Esther Morrison. Alison, how was how has Wigan's attitude towards retail changed during lockdown? And I know you just um, uh, talked a little bit then about about the approach that Wigan has taken. But wonder whether you could perhaps reflect on some of the differences that you've already started to notice in Wigan Town Centre and some of the things you might need to do differently. 
Yes, I mean, we have got too much retail space. So what the, one of the things our attitude has changed is we know that we need to use our town centres differently for cultural offers, for leisure offers. And, you know, we've got a huge um, gallery space in the middle of the town centre. So we are looking at town centres completely different. We are looking at it in terms of work lift space. So some of those traditional areas that would have been retail, we're looking at a complete redesign in our 10 year ambition for the town centre. So we're going out to procurement now for a strategic partner. And that isn't bringing in a residential space, that's bringing in completely mixed use. So we're looking at um, in particular housing. So bringing housing for the first time ever into the town centre. We've um, managed to get along with the Wigan Pier development. Um, people know Wigan Pier, it's famous. Uh, hopefully you know about it, but actually, uh, along the stretch of Wigan Pier is going to be a cultural offer, uh, resident uh, food and drink, sorry, and uh, a cultural offer. But actually, we're putting town centre housing in there. Um, it's already sold off plan. So we know there's a demand there to bring town centre housing back. Um, it's in an e excellent position right near the West Coast main line. So, you know, it's a completely different offer that we're thinking about for the future with our hopefully a new strategic partner when we get through the procurement exercise. Uh, we have got too much retail space. We need to do something about it and reimagine our places. Oh, thanks very much for that, Alison. Uh, well, let's move on to a bit of a discussion then about retail, housing, employment spaces, and no, no one better than Dan Mitchell to, to be able to talk to us about that. So, Dan, uh, very, kind, Sean, very kind indeed. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, so, I'm a, I'm a town planner by profession. I was born in Wigan, Alison. But, uh, so, there we go. I like that. But I live in Yorkshire now. Uh, I'm afraid. So my uh, uh, my favourite motorway is the M62. I, I love that motorway in the morning. And um, I just wanted to start there, really, because because when we talk about the Northern Powerhouse, we we often talk about Northern Powerhouse in the context of transport and trains. And I think a lot of people think that what that's what the Northern Powerhouse actually is. It's it's those Northerners whinging about the train link between Manchester uh, and Leeds and on to Hull. And of course, it's a lot more than that, as we all know. Um, as a company, we've been very involved with the UK 27 Commission inquiry into regional inequality, led by Lord, Lord Bob Kerslake. And that commission issued their final report in February before COVID um, and demonstrated that really inequality in the UK is really deep seated. And that's what the Northern Powerhouse is trying to address. So I just wanted to touch on uh, three themes, Sean, which uh, hopefully will spark a bit of a, a debate this morning. Um, and the first of those is about the work-life balance of housing and the opportunity in the North. And what we have is a great housing stock and we have great access to some amazing open spaces and national parks. And they're within 30 minutes of Wigan and the, the North of Manchester, we can get out to some really great spaces. And that is becoming quite interesting because uh, what the current situation has demonstrated is that people value access to open space and are keen to find uh, those opportunities. Uh, so I think moving forward, we're going to have a more agile workforce that values open space. We've already seen rural agents seeing a massive increase in inquiries in those areas. And what we have to do is create a, a housing stock and supply uh, with better fibre, better connectivity and access to open space. And I know a number of the authorities in the north are looking at that. We've been working with uh, Rochdale Council recently, and Rochdale are really keen on attracting higher value houses into their area that stimulates uh, economic growth at the same time. So they've really got their head around uh, housing and growth uh, really being a, a big part of their uh, overall economic strategy. Um, so that was the first thing, I think, about work-life balance, housing, what's the opportunities there. The, um, the second theme uh, and link to that is the role of the SME sector in, in growth. And I often think this is overlooked uh, in property and real estate terms. We think big in terms of big logistics parks across the north where the next uh, great big warehouse scheme is. But what we often miss um, is, is what those uh, existing indigenous businesses are in places like Wigan and Rochdale and Bolton and over in Yorkshire and what the opportunities are to help those um, entrepreneurs grow their businesses. 
These, these are um, organizations that are often operating out of really substandard accommodation and space, and they really need opportunities to grow. Um, as a sort of anecdote to that, we very recently um, developed a project up in Carnforth, up on the M6. And Carnforth is a place that you drive past on the way to the Lake District, and very few people stop there. And we identified a site, um, and we actually found a, an operator in, in a, a Porsche garage um, that took the first space. And what we were finding is that even though that, that scheme wasn't uh, directly supported by planning officers in the first instance, we were absolutely inundated by local businesses writing in in support of the scheme. And once we got a consent, we could have filled that site seven times over with local businesses keen to expand. So I think, I think how we facilitate and help the SME sector to grow, I think is really important. Uh, my, my third point, uh, and I'll try and keep this quite short, is about uh, economic growth strategies and how they manifest themselves into spatial land use plans. Now that sounds a bit geeky and planning-ish for this time in the morning when probably half the people watching this are also doing the Joe Wicks workout um, in parallel. But, um, you know, let's, let's be clear about what we need. We, we have... Uh, and I've got to mention this, Sean, I know you've been involved in the background, but I've got to mention the Greater Manchester Spatial Framework. You know, this is a document and a plan for growth that started in 2016, and we're still no further on um, in terms of that document. Again, you know, that's, a, that's a key part of what will you know, encourage economic growth and housing strategies moving forwards. But it's not just Manchester, it's the same in, in the Liverpool City region and the same in the West Yorkshire region. And we really need these big spatial plans to really come together. Um, and I think that's a, an important place to stop from my perspective. But, you know, what we need is local plans to advance land that creates the opportunities for new homes and jobs moving forward. Dan, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm scribbling down notes sort of quickly to sort of come back to all the points that are being raised. But before we do that, let's, uh, Chris, maybe we can get your reflections on what you've heard so far in there. Um, thanks. Thanks. Um, hello, everyone. Um, yeah, I, I come at this um, from a slightly different angle from all the people on this uh, on this webinar in that um, my career has been in national media in London. Um, I grew up in Barrow. Um, I love the North passionately. Um, I've been accused on Guido Fawkes of banging on about the North um, too much. But um, I wanted to make a few points. Um, I, I think the Northern Powerhouse um, is at a crossroads. Um, it's, uh, we, we've come up against the worst health and economic crisis um, that we've ever experienced, and that's put huge, huge pressure on government finances and borrowing um, the, uh, the um, um, Treasury is heading for uh, borrowings of 300 billion. Um, that means that every pound is being queried, the Treasury is pouring over everything. So there's pressure like there's never been before. Um, the second thing is, um, in the national media and indeed in national politics uh, and in London, um, there's a tendency for the Northern powerhouse to be defined purely in terms of, of trains and tarmac. Um, and what that means is, while that's a good thing in the sense that there's, there's obviously a complete lack of investment that has been over the years. Um, I mean, in, on my journey to Barrow um, to see my family, I can almost see, feel the decline in transport. I get a, a a fast commuter train into London um, from where I live in southwest London. I get the tube, I get the west coast line, and then I get off at Lancaster, and then I'm on some frankly out of date, secondhand, rattling, no, uh, rolling stock across the across Morecambe Bay, and you feel that decline. And um, so, while it's a good thing that transport is being invested in, um, the danger for Northern Powerhouse, and I think this is really significant danger is that um, that's all it's seen as. And what that means is that in the South, um, in London, in national politics, national media, there's an element of tokenism, which is, um, it, you know, we'll chuck many transport projects up North, everything will be fine. Uh, that's the Northern powerhouse. 
almost job done. Um, and that tokenism has haunted the northern economy um, all the way through ever since um, the decline in, in manufacturing industry. Um, I mean, Dan just now mentioned um, uh, sort of joining up spaces. Um, I've seen it time and time again across the north where um, a big project is put forward, money's chucked in, put into it, that's great. And then everybody moves on. It's almost like the caravan moves on. Nobody's joining up the dots. And by the dots, I don't just mean tarmac and, tra and, and trains. Um, I, I mean skills. Um, you know, having trains and buses and all that, well, that's great. But people need to have jobs. Um, they need jobs. They need skills. They need um, uh, good housing stock. I mean, the North has very poor very poor housing stock, post uh, pre-industrial, well, in, industrial housing stock, it's very poor. Um, and uh, again, these have to be long-term jobs. They have to be proper jobs, sustainable jobs, not just somebody coming in, chucking a load of money at a, an empty, at a factory or, or a site because the government gave them a grant, um, they're foreign owned, and when times are hard, they'll, they'll, go off again. I mean, I remember, I'll stop in a minute, but I remember, for instance, in Barrow, when I was a kid, um, uh, somebody came and opened a big factory there, and we all stood there and um, applauded, and, and it's fantastic, and I was a small boy, and it was very exciting. Um, I think within 15, 20 years, the factory was empty, those people had gone, it was abandoned, and I think it's now a garage. And that that has gone on right across the north. Um, it has to stop. The north has to stop becoming a, an industrial heritage site. Um, and I think the other key thing I'd say is that, in the final stop now, um, I'm often asked to speak in the north and go back to schools and colleges. And it's quite interesting. I'm always asked to speak. The head will always ask me to speak on the same subject. And, and they always say, please, can you make people here believe in themselves and give them aspiration? And that is so critical to the North. I spent most of my working life, all my working life in the South. People, because of their connection to London, do, I mean, there are obviously poor pockets around London. I get that. But people in London generally, and this, you know, I don't want to be too flippant, sound flippant, but they have aspiration they have a connection and that connection has to be put into the north people in wigan bolton berry bradford barrow blackpool wherever it is they have to believe in themselves and the key thing there is they have to stop the talent the the, the, the um, talent has to stop draining away um and that's hugely important i mean if i think of my own school to grammar school in barrow I'd say a third, if not almost half, half those boys who left never went back. Um, and that has to change. And I'll stop there. <laughs> oh, Chris, um, Chris, thank you very much for that. And well, I mean, what a fantastic range of perspectives. I don't think we should ever worry about banging on about the North. Um, I think that's perfectly fine to do. I fondly refer to London as Manchester South, um, which is an important, uh, important part of the world. Um, but I, I think maybe, uh, Anna, if I can just come to you next, because I want to just sort of pick up some of the themes and we've started to get some questions coming through. But um, I suppose local uh, transport connectivity was a key theme there. So not just HS2, but what happens when you get off the train? How do you disperse yourself around uh, within the within the region? So Northern Mail, the, renation, the renationalisation of that. Uh, bus bus uh, franchising in Greater Manchester and beyond. I wonder whether we can perhaps get some of your thoughts on just how easy the North is to get around so that if there is new jobs that are created, uh, it's not just other people that are coming to get them, but people are actually able to travel to them and, and access them locally. And any thoughts on that, Anna? Yeah, absolutely. So I, th I think there are various issues there and there are lots of really good things happening. I think just following on from what Chris is saying, it's important that we don't just turn this into a narrative of what's happened during my lifetime. So the last 42 years, it needs to be something that we, we see that the positive things that are happening and the positive steps that 
various people across the north are taking to take new steps that haven't been um, downloaded to them by central government but are things that they're thinking of in their communities in their towns to make things better so on, on transport and local transport there are lots of really interesting things happening you've got um, Liverpool looking at its um, hydrogen powered buses um, you've got Leeds looking at finally again another mass transit system that will hopefully work really well this time um, you've got people looking at how the north really importantly through the strategy that transport for the north have created can take control of that so let's look properly at, at devol devolution of those transport powers and hopefully allied to some revenue powers can be kept in the north and organized through the north so that people who understand that and local leaders and local combined authority leaders who understand which areas need those transport links um, can decide where that money spent um, and I think devolution is probably the most important thing in making sure that that local transport comes forward in the right way. Brilliant and, and, and thinking about sort of devolution and it's linked really I suppose um, Dan to your point around the spatial framework so uh, I remember at the time um, when leading traffic the argument that was put to government was uh, if you devolve power on things like spatial plans and uh, transport connectivity and so on, uh, because we know our areas really well, we have the resilience and the ability to take tough decisions that in central government um, sometimes often don't happen. Um, and yet here we have an example of the spatial framework in Greater Manchester that still hasn't uh, been adopted uh, all these years on. So I wonder whether we might want to think about how resilient and prepared the North is to be able to take these decisions and maybe get some thoughts from you Dan on that and then Alison uh, maybe from a from a Greater Manchester context obviously there's been significant change uh, in Greater Manchester over the last uh, few years you know how things are working today and get your your thoughts would be interesting and then I just wanted to ask Chris before I move on to the questions from the people that we've got watching there was a study um, I think from KPMG that said uh, the North West is going to be amongst the hardest economically hardest hit um, uh, in COVID and responding from COVID. But, uh, but at the same time, there was a study from Deloitte that said people in the North are the most optimistic about recovery uh, because uh, I think that's what we do. We just get up and carry on with things and keep going. And um, so the juxtaposition between those two things, maybe get some reflections from everybody on that. So Dan, our ability to take decisions, what's needed from public and private sector to be able to support that. Alison, maybe your reflections on that. And then, you know, our... our, our you know, we might be hardest hit, but we're going to recover recover quickest. Um, is is that true, uh, Dan? Over to you. I suppose on um, on planning, cutting planning red tape always features where we're in economic recessionary territory, and clearly that's something that we try and do all the time. And we welcome that as a, an aid to recovery. Um, I think linked to that. Uh, we have to be very careful that we don't start to cut local authority planning and real estate budgets. Um, and um, we need planning departments to be as resourced as ever to deal with what will be an upsurge in projects and activity when the bounce back comes. Um, and that that's always happens, and that's what, where we are at the moment. So sometimes what we see is the private sector coming back with applications moving forward at the same time as local authority planning departments get cut. Um, and clearly what we need to do is make sure we've got the skills and tools to deliver on the projects that are going to lead to our growth. Um, on, the, on the spatial frameworks and planning, I think one of the issues from, from my perspective on, on Greater Manchester Spatial Framework, and it's the same elsewhere in other areas, is that these are very complicated documents now, and they try to deal with everything in one go. And there's two words which uh, are mentioned which cause uh, all the... Uh, uh, public sector major issues in that respect, which is green belt. And, um, and that ultimately is the thing that causes um, uh, lots of issues and, and why we've now got a delay um, in Greater Manchester Spatial Framework moving forward. And maybe some of that should be devolved back to the local authorities to deal with, to enable those that are more progressive to get on with their local plans and others that have a bit more difficulty in balancing um, those particular issues uh, to, to debate that a little bit further. But that is obviously the reason behind uh, some of the delays to that spatial framework. Um, I think moving forwards, obviously, greater collaboration 
is, is so important here. There's some fantastic examples of that across the north. Uh, we're currently working very closely with Wirral Council and Muse in bringing forward a whole host of sites for redevelopment and regeneration on the Wirral, which is absolutely fantastic news. So that's what we do really well in the north, is collaborating, bringing people together, having these discussions and then generating these ideas. So more of the above like that, please. And Alison Wiggins been at the forefront of reimagining sort of that relate that role between citizen and state, and also you know all of the investment that's made, uh, and trying to take advantage of these new powers. Um, what needs to happen next in Wigan? Uh, you know, just going back to Dan's point, I think you, you know that the arguments or the de delay has been on green belts, and I think it's been very difficult. And people who've been observing that, I've, I've seen that. But I think what we have got to strengthen is in our, is in our communities, in our local business sector, and certainly within Wigan, uh, we've been trying to build on that. So through the Wigan deal, it's been our way of working with communities, the business sector, and our residents to build on that. And I think that's about listening to what local places want and building on that. So certainly as we come out of COVID, the things that are coming out strong are community wealth building, building on the local businesses, and they've really stepped up during COVID. Um, so how do we support those through local supply chains, more sustainable business, you know, healthier population, healthier communities? And the other thing that's become apparent is um, the green agenda is becoming much more in the spotlight. It was anyway, but you know, if we look at some of our social media feeds from residents, um, you know, there's a massive opportunity here now to make a shift in terms of what we can do on low carbon economy, uh, what we can do for that in the sector and what we can do in terms of sustainable transport. So the ability to build on the cycling networks, walking networks, you know, some of the thoughts that we're having on safe streets and how we're building back safe streets across GM are things that I think give us an opportunity perhaps to do things differently and think about things differently and reflect. So I think our strength in communities is really important. It has been in Wigan for some time and um, certainly that fairer, inclusive approach to the economy will be at the forefront of our uh, recovery plans. Amazing. Chris, any thoughts? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm aware of both those studies, the KPMG and the Deloitte. Um, and it, on the face of it, they look contradictory. They're not actually. Um, I mean, the KPMG is really looking at the economy of the North, um, manufacturing distribution. They are going to be hit, um, hit heavily uh, post-COVID. Um, Deloitte is more an emotional thing. Um, and it, that's really, uh, I mean, people in the North are optimistic. Um, they're optimistic in Northern terms, which might not be quite the same as optimistic other places in the world. If anything, they're resilient. Um, there's an attitude in the North as, which we all grew up with, which is not, there's nothing phases us. We've seen it all. Um, um, if you grow up in the North, um, you know, as I say, nothing phases you, nothing surprises you. Um, people are very phlegmatic. I mean, I remember years ago, um, well, not that long ago, actually, Barrow was, uh, uh, for some reason, Barrow was decreed to be the most unhappy town in Britain. Um, and the press went mad about this. And they sent journalists up there saying, saying to people, are you really unhappy? And I wrote an article saying what the what people who did the survey don't understand is the people in Barrow are actually happy being unhappy. Um, they quite like it. Um, they, they suits them nothing more than staring into a bottom of a pint glass. Um, and, and that's what they're like. And there's nothing wrong with that. Absolutely nothing wrong. So people in the North are optimistic. Um, they are resilient. Um, but what they need, uh, and to send on a serious note, what they end, what they need are the tools. Um, they need connected transport, they need skills, um, they need economic clusters built around proper skills. And somebody said earlier on, on this, they use the word sustainable in relation to jobs. That's so, so important. These have to be long-term sustainable jobs. Those are the things that people need. Totally agree. And uh... Uh, let, let's just take so, Chris. Thanks for that. Let's take some of the questions that are coming in. And Alison, you touched on this a little bit. Um, so there's two questions that are linked around um, sustainability 
climate resilience, uh, environment, environmental and social infrastructure. So there's one from Mark Jenkinson, um, which says, Alison, uh, you mentioned the sustainable future. Uh, how much bandwidth do you and other towns and cities in the north have to focus on climate resilience? And I think this is born out of a, um, a fact, really, that many local authorities have declared climate emergencies. Um, but what happens next? Um, and you know, how does that link into really having good growth uh, in the north? Uh, because often I think about this, when we think about uh, London and the southeast, it's much more difficult to fix something after the fact than it is to prepare for it in the first place. So how do we grow, uh, grow sustainably and friendly? And that is linked to uh, a question from Anna, uh, Annie Pang, who says, does the... Uh, no, it's not a question from Annie Pang. Uh, let me uh, find uh, the second question, which was how important, from Ashley Dunseith even, uh, which is how important is investment in social and environmental infrastructure as a driver of growth uh, in the northern powerhouse? So perhaps, um, Alison, Dan, you might want to reflect on that and then I'll get to the next question. Sorry, Sean, I just wanted to rather to ask. Can I get, going to let Dan come in first, but happy to go first. So, yes, yeah, certainly in our new priorities, um, sustainable economic recovery for the benefits of everyone is what we're looking at so within that community wealth building approach is something that we want to do and we're going to focus on ironically we introduced that just before lockdown but now it's become more more and more important and actually it is the local businesses that have stepped up it isn't just big businesses so when we look at some of the connection to our community hubs and the people who responded on humanitarian aid um, you know actually charity giving helping out in terms of volunteering it was actually local businesses it wasn't some of the significant um, bigger you know food sector manufacturing and other um, big businesses that we've got in Wigan so you know it's ha you know it's looking at all of those sectors um, I think also one of the things that it has given us an opportunity is to look at the low carbon economy um, we are going to have issues with our budgets and, you know, we need to get that investment in. But actually, um, we've done a lot of work on the green agenda, working um, through our envir environment team and also with some consultants who have helped us think about uh, what the new green economy could be. And there are some investable propositions out there. So actually, it's how we get those going pretty quick now. And in terms of sustainable transport, I think I mentioned there are, is an opportunity um, through the investment that we've got in cycling networks, we're going to push ahead um, in terms of trying to get some of our uh, B lines in and our cycling networks in to give people that uh, linkage into public transport networks and alternatives. So there are opportunities, but the big issue that we will have is the financial gap and how we look at some of our budgeting because, um, you know, we'd come out of austerity, got ourselves into a great position. But now we are facing, you know, um, you know, a really challenging time in terms of what that will mean and how we will look at some of our priorities and where we'll, you know, what we'll need to do in terms of our budget position. But a it's certainly a real focus is around the green agenda and sustainable economy recovery uh, on that community wealth building. So I think there are things that we will focus on and politicians will, you know, we'll need to talk to our politicians about how we put some energy into these areas um, and they do raise difficult questions, don't they? And I think it's how we get through some of that and have that dialogue with the public, because I think they're the ones who are demanding it now and listening to our residents. It's, it's how we come alongside them and do some of this. Fantastic. I, think so, I suppose just to add to that, Sean, from my perspective, I totally agree with what Alison's just, just set out. Um, but I think over the last couple of years, we have seen uh, more emphasis being placed on environmental and social infrastructure to answer Ashley's question there and um, particularly in the last few years we've seen the emergence of things like healthy new towns, garden villages, we're often asked to do health impact assessments with our planning applications these days as well um, and I think that has been uh, highlighted now with the current situation with Covid on what the value of our open spaces actually is and I think we often underestimate these uh, spaces within our towns and city and development strategies and they play a really crucial role in strengthening resilience and the quality of life, uh, health and well-being um, of our communities. Uh, one of the things that we've been recently doing in my practice is we've been involved in developing a new tool for, for use by uh, local authorities and developers. It's called Greenkeeper. I can provide people the link to Greenkeeper if they want to email me afterwards. 
but this is a tool developed with a number of universities and local authorities, which is all about trying to understand the value and the financial value of what open spaces actually are within urban areas and how they perform in terms of supporting local communities. So that's a piece of work we've been involved with recently, but I think you know, it's, it's obviously growing in importance. Um, Chris, I wonder whether you could have a look at this question for us. So from Annie Pang, I'm thinking in what Alison has just mentioned around, you know, SMEs and local businesses have sort of come up to before. It's does the panel think the pandemic has brought different professions and sizes of businesses together on a more even keel? So, you know, how does the strength of the North, which is our, you know, diversity in, uh, in economic sectors, really pull together to make this thing happen? And then I think... Um, Anna, if we link that to Barry's question, which is uh, around uh, the anticipated growth in home working, leading to more people wanting to live in our rural areas and the policy implications of that. What, what do we think that means for the Northern Powerhouse and the priorities that it's, uh, that it's had uh, up to now? Um, so, Chris, uh, over, to, over to you. Um, I, I think it's too early to say on the... Um what what the fallout of corona and covid is going to be um clearly localization um that is going to be one effect um and big corporatism less so um that would put the north in a very good place um i, I, I it's too early to say. I think I think it will bring organ. And there is a bringing together. There is a certainly people are working a lot, a lot closer together. Um, but I think you know. Let's see what happens. Um, but the north it should be in a good place. Um, but the key thing for me is this. It, 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 it's actually pulling the whole thing together. It's not just as I say. It's not just tarmac and trains. Um, people need digital. And they need skills. And if you can get all that together um, with good housing stock, um, the North is a great place to be. And it's very well placed if it just realises this. And if people in the South can stop thinking, well, you know, if you chuck a few billion quid at a rail project so you can get from Liverpool to Leeds a lot quicker, it's a lot, it's a lot more than that. Anna, your thoughts on... Policy priorities for the Northern Powerhouse, how, how are they going to change? I think the two biggest things that the Northern Powerhouse need to focus on now are digital and um, skills. I think what Chris said is absolutely right. Um, we have to get the full fibre in. We have to make sure that 5G comes on quickly and in the right way um, so that we don't leave people behind again. So we don't uh, basically make those gaps between city and town and between north and south worse. Um, and we have to make sure that from a social mobility point of view and a skills and training point of view, that if people are living increasingly in rural areas, how do we make sure that the young people and the children have the right education and vocational training to make them ready for the opportunities that the investment in things like infrastructure will bring? So something like a, a rail project that should um, sustain a massive growth in engineering opportunities um, and opportunities in the traditional sectors that the North was always so good at. Um, lots of companies are willing to get behind that and to increase their numbers of apprenticeships, um, to make long-term investments in new factories and in new um, facilities for training across the North. If we get certainty of what will come and what investment will be available, then the private sector will build around that and the third sector and universities will build around that. So I think that the two strands of digital and um, training are where we all need to focus uh, in terms of the results of what we're doing. Great. Uh, Dan, can I ask you David uh, Atkinson's question around incredible levels of development in city centres over the last uh, 10 years, uh, but it's at the expense of quality uh, in some respects. Um, and if you link that to Chris's opening remarks uh, in relation to, um, you know, the, the existing quality in the North, how do we make sure that when we say we're going to build back better, that we actually mean it and we take the decisions uh, that are necessary to do that? How does the North stand now in, in uh, to be able to do some of these things 
uh, in in future. So uh, that, that 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 blowing of lines between how people live and work in the spaces they're going to want. Was that to me, Sean? Then is <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah, it broke up a little bit then. Um, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, we're involved with lots of different projects across the north, and um, it's quite interesting. We get very different responses to our our designs and our master plans that we do and our clients' projects. And we actually have um, situations where we're often advancing projects. I've got, I won't say where it is, I've got to be very careful on this one at the moment. I, I mean, I'm doing an existing residential project where the local authorities are asking me to, to reduce the quality of that scheme so that it better fits the adoptable standards of the highways department that they have internally. Uh, we've got some really nice shared services, some great open space in the middle, and we're being actively encouraged to put more tarmac on site and more uniformed uh, road layout designs so that it's easier for the other parts of the council to adopt uh, those highways. And, and that's, yeah, it's an ongoing debate about education and really pushing the boundaries. And a lot of our clients are embracing that change now. It's not about developing a, a minimum standard. Uh, lots of councils have um, uh, residential design guides in place now. Uh, there's a lot of information out there. There's now a national framework for uh, design through the planning process, which is really important. And uh, you know, we've, we find that clients are embracing that, but we also need uh, you know, the skills uh, on the public sector side to help help us create these better places. It is an ongoing um, debate that we're having to sort of weave our way through very, very carefully. So I wonder, I wonder whether I can ask everybody, um, a lot of the things we're talking about, you know, are long-term interventions. You'll see the, you'll see the, the benefits of them for young people uh, in maybe five, 10 or 15 years time. Um, but obviously we live in society that wants results today, wants to see the Northern power, Powerhouse happening today. Um, how do you square that off and how do, you, how do you get it to work? Chris, do you have any thoughts on that, um, perhaps? Um, What's well, the role I of the media? <laughs> um, I think within that context, the transport, um, the transport is hugely important. Um, um, and if progress can really be made, um, not just on trains, but also on roads um, and bus services. Those are tangible things that people can see and they're very important. Um, the thing about a transport project is um, in, in terms of selling it to the public, to the media, to politicians, um, it's tangible. It has, a be it has a beginning, it has an end and it has a benefit and people can see that. So the sooner those projects can get started and underway, that will be transformative in terms of the mood and then the rest of it should follow in and my my worry which i said at the beginning is the northern powerhouse cannot only cannot just be defined by transport and there is a tendency certainly in the in in the national media and at westminster for that to be the case but as long as the case is made and the pleas are made and the arguments are made for digital skills and training and improve housing stock and the living and living and working environment, then that should happen. It should be fine. And Anna, is that shared at the Northern Powerhouse partnership level? The, the, the deep rooted commitment to making this succeed. Um, no, sorry, go on. I think so. Yeah, absolutely. So it's all about seeing a program of change, I think, and seeing the, the benefits at each stage and then lots of people talking about things in the same way with, with single messages that make it very clear to people what the benefits are. And, and sorry to harp back to Devo, but I, I do think that where well, we've seen very strong local leadership, um, that those messages have got through to people. Um, thinking about what um, the Tees Valley Mayor has been able to do and the, pro the project with the, the new carbon capture scheme that will hopefully come along for the old SSI site in Teesside, where I'm from. That's a, that's a, that will be absolutely massive for that area. And the messaging there is very clear. It's very direct. There's a, there's a real connection between the people of that area and their mayor. And I think by using that local power base and by giving people the power to actually change things, 
in their own areas and to communicate with their people in the right way. You can show them the progression. But if you don't know that you're getting the investment, if you don't know that things are going to happen, if you've continually got political debate um, and um, it being used as a political football, then people continually get disappointed. And I think that's why you don't get the buy in. Thank you very much for that. So we are into our final few minutes on this uh, webinar and I wanted to ask each of our uh, panellists uh, a final question which is what makes you optimistic about the future of the Northern Powerhouse whether that's for young people or what we're going to do? What makes us happy when you've had a group of proud northerners for the last 55 minutes chat away about the north? What, what's, what's, what's exciting about the future? So Dan maybe we can um, start for you. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll start with that. I think one thing that was really positive in the North and real estate is the strength and the talent that's coming out of our universities, often surprised by how they come up with some, such amazing ideas that challenge the work that we're doing and what, how we're working at the moment. So I think there's a really good talent pool that we've got across our universities into real estate, and that, that makes me happy. Well, Anna, um, spell some of the points you've had. Makes you smile. I think it's I think there are a lot of people that are very invested in making this work. Um, I think we do look for inspiration to uh, our younger people. I think the universities the retention rate from universities is, is really good in some areas now. We don't have the same brain drain that that we used to have. And I also think that the, the way that the private sector and the public sector collaborate in the north is becoming stronger and stronger as the the local leaders um, work together in a much more unified way. Um, there are lots of um, companies, and I guess I would say that being from the private sector, but I think there are lots of companies that are willing to stand um, shoulder to shoulder with the public sector for the long term um, and deliver uh, in, not just for profit, but in part for what they want to do for, for their areas. And I do think that's genuine and that, that does de definitely make me smile. Chris, your turn. Um, I think You're I think always smiling, I like it. <laughs> I think the thing that makes me smile is the fact that there are discussions like this. Um, uh, there are discussions at national level. There's an old and powerhouse partnership. Um, these never happened before. Um, people are much more joined up um, and there's a realisation that change has to happen. And that's new. I mean, you know, we're talking about the Northern Powerhouse Partnership as though it's relatively old. Um, it, it's less than 10 years old. Um, this is a whole, this is a new thing. If you then put that together with a general election where the North voted um, and the realisation at the national level in politics that the North matters, um, that gives me huge optimism that the, the, the people, people, are, people at last are beginning to get it. Um, and it's taken an awful long time and an awful lot of decline to get there, but they are at last getting it. And that has to, that has to be a cause for optimism. Excellent. Alison, um, thanks for that, Chris. Um, and over to you. Uh, if I can have two. The first one would be, I think, in the midst of the COVID crisis, we've still managed to really build on some strategic partnerships. So just one, for example, Edgehill University, which is on the, uh, just the edge of our borough, um, between the university, our local college, the hospital, the hospital trust and ourselves as the council, we've signed a strategic partnership to look at how we can think about our young people for the future in terms of both the health and social care sector, uh, the medical sector and the digital sector. And that's about giving real people in Wigan, the young people of Wigan, opportunities linked to the hospital, uh, linked to the university and linked to the college. And, you know, the level of positivity in the conversations between all of the organisations in that is really ambitious and really a, a willingness to want to see a brighter future, uh, both for young people, but also for people who might want to, to, to reskill and relearn. So I think that's one. And then the second thing I think goes back to what I said earlier, which is around uh, the spirit of the North and communities. Um, we got behind a street in Wigan, which was actually a road in Wynn Stanley, Pemberton Road, uh, voted the friendliest street in, Wigger, uh, in Britain uh, last week. And that's around the spirit of the people and people coming together. And um, I think we do need to build on that because that's something that, you know, shows the positivity. So there is the ambition still there and there is that positivity. So for me, 
um, so many opportunities and we, we just re really need to uh, get on with them and, and think about what we can do together and the building on the partnerships is key to that. Private, public, community, that's, that's the way we're going to get through this. Brilliant. Well, what a fantastic set of four answers to finish on. So I'm going to hand back to, to Ross. I hope you've enjoyed watching the webinar. Thank you to our um, panellists. And uh, uh, it was great on behalf of Creators to host this event. And Ross, uh, over to you. Thanks, Sean. Uh, thanks very much. That was uh, really good, really interesting. Um, in common with a lot of the other sessions that we've had this week, um, so many great stories, um, some consensus, some discussion. Um, but really fabulous. Thanks very much to Creators for putting that together. Um, and thank you also to all the speakers. Um, loved you all. Thanks very much. Thanks to Chris particularly for smiling so much. Um, it's a joy to watch. Um, so uh, we've, got a, we, we've got a poll right now um, for you. This is a poll that we're conducting uh, across all of the events this week. Um, you can see it there. What will be the most important factor in kickstarting development, recovering the strength of UK real estate post-COVID? Um, you just uh, pop, pop your answers in. Um, and then we'll uh, we'll put them all together across all of the poll, uh, all of the um, sessions this week um, for uh, an interesting piece of information at the end of it. Um, thanks, uh, like I said, to all the speakers. Thanks to Kratos for putting it together. Um, thank you to all the people who've sat and listened. But very good to have you here. A quick plug: um, I said at the beginning we've had around 1,200 people um, at a dozen or so events so far this week. We've got more. Um, there's three more today, uh, four more today. Gosh. Uh, one about construction communications um, in the COVID crisis uh, at 11. We've got placemaking for innovation at two o'clock. Um, we've got a session about Oldgate, uh, the Oldgate bid uh, at three o'clock and uh, a West London business session on leadership um, at four o'clock. Um, and then there's more tomorrow. We've got sessions about Wealth and Forest, about investing in infrastructure and about designing for education. Um, there's really lots. Check it out on the website um, and uh, sign up for some if you haven't already. It'd be great to see you. Um, and finally, uh, we have uh, also announced um, this week that we intend to do this again. Um, we are gluttons for punishment. Um, we are kicking off uh, October the 5th to the 9th, uh, another week of Real Estate Live. So um, uh, an appeal to all of you to come back then and to think about perhaps um, mounting your own uh, events in the week and, uh, and joining them in with us. Um, so thanks very much to speakers, to creators, uh, to everyone involved. And I'll say goodbye. Goodbye now. Thanks. Thank you.